The 8th of September, 1943, Nazi Germany. Adolf Hitler receives a telegram from the SS General, Werner Best, the German civilian administrator in Denmark, in which he proposes that the Germans deport the Danish Jews to concentration camps. After nine days, Hitler approves the measure, and two weeks later on the night of the 1st of October, the German police begins the roundup. However, while the Nazis find empty house after empty house, the Danes organize the rescue of the Jews by smuggling them in large fishing boats, as well as in rowboats or kayaks to freedom in neutral Sweden. Over 99% of Denmark's Jewish population survives the Holocaust because a German naval attaché serving at the embassy in Copenhagen, at great risk to himself, warned the Danes of the deportation plan. His name is Georg Dukwitz. Georg Ferdinand Dukwitz was born on the 29th of September, 1904 in Bremen, then part of the German Empire. Georg came from a family of wealthy merchants, and after graduating from high school, he studied economics and law at Albert Ludwig University of Freiburg. Dukwitz then pursued a career in the international coffee trade, and between 1928 and 1932, he lived and worked in Copenhagen, Denmark, as a brand manager for the Café Haag Company. Inspired by Adolf Hitler's ideas, on the 1st of November 1932, Dukwitz joined the Nazi Party, which came into power in January 1933. On the 1st of July the same year, Dukwitz joined the Nazi Party's Office of Foreign Affairs in Berlin and worked there as a Scandinavia consultant. However, over the course of his tenure, he became increasingly disillusioned by Nazi politics. In a 4th of June 1935 letter to Alfred Rosenberg, the head of the office, he wrote, My two-year employment in the executive branch of the Nazi party has made me realize that I am so fundamentally deceived in the nature and purpose of the National Socialist Movement that I am no longer able to work within this movement as an honest person. Around the same time, the Gestapo secret police made its first notes on Dukwitz after he had sheltered three Jewish women in his Kofurstendam apartment during a local anti-Semitic event led by members of the SA. Dukwitz then became a fierce opponent of this Nazi system. In 1935, he switched to the shipping business, which led to a move to New York City, where he worked for the Hamburg America Line. When the Second World War began, on the 1st of September 1939, Dukwitz was in Germany. When the German Ministry of Transport opened positions for shipping clerks to work in neutral countries, Dukwitz, given his background in Denmark, applied for the Copenhagen Post and won the job. Soon, the Nazi Foreign Ministry assigned him to the German Embassy in Copenhagen as an expert in maritime affairs. On the 9th of April 1940, when Nazi Germany invaded Denmark, the Royal Danish Army put up scant resistance, and the Royal Navy surrendered without firing a single shot. In the beginning, whatever negative attitudes the Danes had about the Germans were expressed through passive resistance, or giving them the cold shoulder rather than open defiance, armed resistance, or sabotage. When Nazi Germany invaded Denmark, the Jewish population in the country was approximately 7,500, accounting for 0.2% of the total population. About 6,000 of these Jews were Danish citizens. The rest were German and Eastern European refugees. Most Jews lived in the country's capital and largest city, Copenhagen. Until 1943, the German occupation regime took a relatively benign approach to Denmark. The Germans were eager to cultivate good relations with a population they perceived as fellow Aryans. Although Germany dominated Danish foreign policy, the Germans permitted the Danish government complete autonomy in running domestic affairs, including maintaining control over the legal system and police forces. Considering the relatively small Jewish population and the support most Danes gave to their fellow Jewish citizens, Germany initially decided not to make a major issue of the Jewish question in Denmark. In fact, the representative of the German Foreign Office at the Wannsee Conference recommended that the Scandinavian countries be excluded from the final solution, on the assumption that the Jewish question could be resolved there once overall victory had been achieved. While the implementation of the final solution in Norway negated this recommendation, the general policy of non-interference in Denmark was decisive for the absence of such measures there. 
Unlike in other Western European countries, the Danish government did not require Jews to register their property and assets, to identify themselves, or to give up apartments, homes, and businesses. In addition, Jews were not required to wear a yellow star or badge. Two attempts were made to set fire to the Copenhagen Synagogue in 1941 and 1942, but local police intervened both times to prevent the arson and arrest the perpetrators. The Jewish community continued to function, including holding religious services regularly throughout the German occupation. The refusal of the Danish authorities to discriminate against the Danish Jews and King Christian's outspoken support of the Jewish community has given rise to the apocryphal story that the king himself wore a yellow star. Though untrue, the story reflects the king's opposition to persecuting Denmark's Jewish citizens and residents and the popular perception of Denmark as a country which protected the Jews. However, the tone of the German occupation changed in early 1943. Allied victories convinced many Danes that Germany could be defeated. While there had been minimal resistance to the Germans during the first years of the occupation, labor strikes and acts of sabotage now strained relations with Germany. The Danish government resigned on the 28th of August, 1943, rather than yield to new German demands that German military courts try future saboteurs. The following night, the German military commander, General Hermann von Hanneken, declared martial law. German authorities arrested Danish civilians, Jews and non-Jews alike, and Danish military personnel. Under the state of emergency, German authorities took direct control over the Danish military and police forces. On the 8th of September, 1943, SS General Werner Best, the German civilian administrator in Denmark, sent a telegram to Adolf Hitler to propose the Germans make use of the martial law provisions to deport the Danish Jews. Hitler approved the measure nine days later. However, as preparations proceeded, Best, who had second thoughts about the political consequences of the deportations, informed Georg Dukwitz of the impending deportation operation. At great risk to himself, Dukwitz decided to act and went to Sweden to speak with Prime Minister Albin Hansson in order to persuade his government to welcome all Jews from Denmark. After receiving assurances from the Swedish government, he returned to Denmark. And on the 26th of September, Dukwitz noted in his diary, I must do everything on my own responsibility. I am supported by my steadfast belief that good deeds can never be wrong. His wife, Anna Marie, whom he married in the summer of 1941, gave him her unconditional support. On the 28th of September, 1943, Dukwitz leaked word of the plans for the operation against Denmark's Jews to Hans Hedtoft chairman of the Danish Social Democratic Party. Head Toft contacted the Danish resistance movement and the head of the Jewish community, Karl Bertel Henrik, who in turn alerted the acting chief rabbi, Markus Melchior. At the early morning services on the 29th of September, one day prior to the Rosh Hashanah services, the Jews were warned by Rabbi Melchior of the planned German action and urged to go into hiding immediately and to spread word to all their Jewish friends and relatives. And they did. Jews began to leave their homes by train, car, and on foot. And with the help of the Danish people, they found hiding places in homes, hospitals, and churches. The plan was successful. When German police began the roundup on the night of the 1st of October, 1943, what they found was empty house after empty house. In general, the Danish police authorities refused to cooperate, denying German police the right to enter Jewish homes by force, or simply overlooking Jews they found in hiding. Popular protests quickly came from various quarters, such as churches, the Danish royal family, and various social and economic organizations. The Danish resistance, assisted by many ordinary Danish citizens, organized a partly coordinated, partly spontaneous rescue operation which expanded to include participation by the Danish police and the government. Over a period of about a month, some 7,200 Jews and 700 of their non-Jewish relatives traveled to safety in Sweden, which accepted the Danish refugees. Some were transported in large fishing boats of up to 20 tons, but others were carried to freedom in rowboats or kayaks. The Catch Albatross was one of the ships used to smuggle Jews to Sweden. Some refugees were smuggled inside freight rail cars on the regular ferries between Denmark and Sweden, 
this route being suited to the very young or old, or those who are too weak to endure a rough sea passage. Danish resistance movement operatives had broken into empty freight cars sealed by the Germans after inspection, held refugees onto the cars, and then resealed the cars with forged or stolen German seals to forestall further inspection. The rescue is considered one of the largest actions of collective resistance to aggression in the countries occupied by Germany during the Second World War. However, despite the rescue efforts, the Germans seized a total of 482 Jews in Denmark, mostly elderly and sick, and deported them to the Dresdenstadt ghetto in the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. Most of the deportees were German or Eastern European refugees. Despite the fact that many of those deported were not Danish citizens, the Danish authorities and the Danish Red Cross vocally and insistently demanded information on their whereabouts and living conditions. The vigor of the Danish protests likely deterred the Germans from transporting these Jews to killing centers in German-occupied Poland. The SS authorities of Theresienstadt even allowed Danish prisoners to receive letters and some care packages. The Danish Red Cross was a key driving force behind the request of the International Red Cross to visit and inspect a Riesenstadt, first made in the autumn of 1943. After the Reich Security Main Office authorized the visit, a Danish Red Cross representative accompanied International Red Cross officials during their visit in June 1944. The Danish Jews remained in Theresienstadt, where dozens of them died until 1945. In late April of that year, German authorities handed the Danish prisoners over to the custody of the Swedish Red Cross. Virtually all of the refugees returned to Denmark in 1945. Although a housing shortage required some of them to live in shelters for a few months, most found their homes and businesses as they had left them, since the local authorities had refused to permit the Germans or their collaborators in Denmark to seize or plunder Jewish homes. In total, some 120 Danish Jews died during the Holocaust, either in Theresienstadt or during the flight from Denmark. This relatively small number represents one of the highest Jewish survival rates for any German-occupied European country. After the rescue operation, Georg Dukwitz went back to his official duties. On the 4th of May 1945, at 8.35 p.m., it was announced on British radio that the German troops in Holland Northwest Germany and Denmark had surrendered. This was without a single English, American, or Russian soldier setting foot on Danish soil. The period of occupation thus ended reasonably peacefully, and in most places, people could take to the streets and celebrate their new freedom. After the war, Dukwitz remained in the German Foreign Service, and between 1955 and 1958, he served as the West German ambassador to Denmark and later as the ambassador to India. When Willy Brandt became German foreign minister in 1966, he made Dukwitz secretary of state in West Germany's foreign office. After Brandt became chancellor, he ordered Dukwitz to negotiate an agreement with the Polish government. Brandt's work culminated in the 1970 Treaty of Warsaw, in which both sides, West Germany and the People's Republic of Poland, committed themselves to non-violence and accepted the existing post-war border. Dukwitz then worked as Secretary of State until his retirement in 1970. However, his role in the 1943 rescue campaign was not forgotten. On the 29th of March 1971, Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, decided to recognize Georg Ferdinand Dukwitz as righteous among the nations. Israel's highest honor for non-Jews, who risked their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. Yad Vashem, established in 1953 and located in Jerusalem, is dedicated to Holocaust commemoration, documentation, research, and education. When Dukwitz died on the 16th of February 1973 in Bremen, he was 68 years old. There were many tears shed for Georg Dukwitz. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.